The Bible tells a story in the book of Exodus of the people of God living in slavery for 400 years. Try to imagine what that was like. Now try to imagine the absolutely amazing drama of escape from the power of Egyptian culture. You would have been very familiar with trauma and abuse, generation after generation of it. It must have been such a profound relief to have escaped, living in the wilderness, yet free. On the way to the promised land, Moses had instructed the people to build a new place of worship in the tent of meeting. Thus, the Israelites were surrounded by an amazing display of God's presence and power day and night. In the images that you're about to see, try to imagine how Moses must have felt, overwhelmed with the glory of God, the Shekinah glory in the cloud, and at the same time, surrounded by total wilderness in the Sinai Peninsula. It's not that hard to envision God's people not wanting to leave such a place and move out into the wilderness. It is totally human to want to settle, to locate ourselves and our God to specific places that we imagine we can control. Moses does not want to move without his God. The disciples on Mount Tabor as in the transfiguration story of Jesus, were no different. It is harder and requires more creative imagination to see our Lord as mobile and also creative, adventurous, and mindful of another more distant destination of rest. But, like the Israelites, we carry the glory of God with us where we travel, where we work, where we live, and bear crosses of various kinds in life. There's the thing. We are the temple, the body of Christ. We incredibly have this written onto our hearts. We are remade in his image. As we continue our series of sermons on prayer, we remember that God often answers our prayers with his wonderful presence, but his presence will often lead us to follow him deeper into commitment and discipleship. Let's watch.
Welcome to our online service today. Thank you for joining us. Let's begin our service praying together the call it for purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord, Amen. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And today's prayer O oh God, because without you we are not able to please you, mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts, 
that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God, but especially when we come together in his presence to give thanks for the great benefits we have received at his hands, to declare his most worthy praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace. Praying together, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we've done those things which we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no health in us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent according to your promises declared to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, desires not the death of sinners, but that they may turn from their wickedness and live. He has empowered and commanded his ministers to pronounce to his people being penitent the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardons and absolves all who truly repent and believe his holy gospel. For this reason, we beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that our present deeds may please him, the rest of our lives may be pure and holy, and that at the last we may come to his eternal joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's continue to affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's listen to the Word of God. A reading taking from Exodus chapter 33. As he went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and hover at its entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. When the people saw the cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they would stand and bow down in front of their own tents. Inside the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak with Moses face to face, as one speaks to a friend. Afterward, Moses would return to the camp, but the young man who was assisted him, Joshua son of Nun, would remain behind in the tent of meeting. One day Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, take these people up to the promised land, but you haven't told me whom you will send with me. You have told me, I know you by name, and I look favorably on you. If it is true that you look favorably on me, let me know your ways so I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. And remember that this nation is your very own people. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Aaron, for reading for us today. We also want to wish you a happy birthday on your 13th birthday birthday and we also want to uh, pray God's blessing on Ethan as well which is his birthday so let's pray right now for uh, these two young guys and also for our uh, children in Sunday school father we just bless you 
for, the, uh, for each other. And we pray the rich blessings of God on Aaron, on Ethan, and the rest of the Sunday School. We pray your protection, Lord, on each one during these uh, days of going back to school. So we bless you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The book of Exodus tells us that God's people had been in captivity for 400 years. So God sends Moses to free them and then to lead them to the promised land. So it goes without saying that Moses has an overwhelming task before him. He must lead thousands of people through a harsh wilderness to the promised land. In other words, Moses needs some help. And of course, we can relate to this. Everyone faces situations. Sometimes it feels like we will be overwhelmed by these difficulties. But Moses does a very smart thing. He admits his vulnerability, cries out to God for help, and God answers. So let's pray and then take a closer look from our passage from the book of Exodus. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations in all of our hearts be truly acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. God revealed his plans to Moses and recruits him to deliver the children of promise from the land where for generations they had been enslaved. God says, I've come to rescue them from slavery and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. But while out of the land of slavery and into the promised land sounds like a short trip, nothing is mentioned about the amount of time the people will spend in the wilderness. And as you know, in the end, it took them 40 years. The desert is not intended to be their final destination, but rather a necessary middle space where they will be formed as a people and a community of trust. They must learn how to trust God. But of course, a wilderness is a difficult place. The wilderness will serve as a metaphor for the undesired transitions we too experience in life. Have you ever experienced a wilderness time in life? For the Israelites, their experience in the desert was not meant to be a waste. It was to be pivotal in their transformation as a people. It was where they were to be transformed from the people of slavery into the people of God. But it will not be easy. You see, the wilderness is fertile ground for emotional and moral collapse. When you are passing through a season of prolonged waiting, confusion, or pain, more than anything, your Father in Heaven wants to be trusted. Perhaps the most powerful prayer you can offer during those times is, Lord, I trust you. Lord, I choose to trust you. Let's see how the people of God fared in the Exodus account. Now, as I've said many times before, the context of the Bible passage is important. So we're going to have to back up a bit. If you know the story, what has just happened before Exodus chapter 3, 33? Yes, I know, chapter 32. But you will remember in chapter 32 that it is the record of the golden calf incident. After all of the amazing miracles God does for his people, rescuing them from slavery, the splitting of the Red Sea, the manna in the wilderness, his amazing provision, what do they do? Yes, they worship the golden cow. The making of the golden cow is completely at odds 
with God's revelation of himself. And the irony of the whole thing is that when the people choose to make themselves a God, little g, they will forfeit the presence of Almighty God. The people violated the first two of the Ten Commandments. No other gods, no idols. They go back to what they are used to. They forget the present and go and live in the past. We need to remember that for many generations they were surrounded in Egypt with other gods. Even when the Lord had warned them to obey his commands, they failed. History and archaeology will tell us that many of the Egyptian gods were cow-like. They were fertility gods. In other words, the Israelites would be very familiar with these images. After all, they had seen them for 400 years. What's that expression? You can take the people out of Egypt, but it is difficult to get Egypt out of the people. I find the timing of all this very interesting. The Bible tells us that Moses is on top of the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments from God, and there's fire and smoke and peals of thunder coming from the mountain. But while God is delivering the law to Moses, the people do this thing. They fall into emotional and moral collapse. This is another illustration of what happened at the fall of men and women in the garden. As one commentator said, like the story of the fall in Genesis chapter 3, like the story of the rebellion of the people of the earth before the time of Moses in Genesis chapter 6, that's the story of Noah's Ark, like the story of rebellion in the days of Babel, we see here a unique insight into the deceit that can happen in a person's heart. And remember, the people had said three times, yes, Lord, we will follow you. We will do it your way. But give them 40 days apart from Moses. Now they're worshiping a golden cow. 40 days apart from their leader, and they have broken the covenant. They had had an encounter with the living God. They saw the miracles. They heard the thunder, even, from Mount Sinai. And in less than 40 days, they were following after another God. This is bad news, isn't it? But you can't understand the good news until you've studied and understood the bad news first. Over the years, I've heard people say to me, you know, God will forgive. That's his job. Well, I'm not exactly sure if that's a healthy attitude. Coming to grips with this passage and others like it, their violation of the covenant and its disastrous consequences is really important for us to study. In reality, we deserve to be disowned. We deserve to be cut off. And it's coming to grips with passages like this that help us understand how great grace is. God's grace and love is deeper and wider and better than we can possibly imagine. And until we look at the bad news and put ourselves into these situations and maybe even see our own hearts, then we are incapable of seeing the greatness of God's mercy to us in Christ Jesus. So back to Exodus chapter 32. They pay a terrible price from the judgment of God. It's a sobering passage because there are real consequences. Death. 3,000 people are killed. Exodus chapter 32 verse 9 tells us, Then the Lord said, I have seen how stubborn and rebellious these people are. Now leave me alone, so my fierce anger can blaze against them, and I will destroy them. Then I will make you, Moses, into a great nation. Now why 
does the Lord say this? Because I believe God is inviting Moses to take the role of mediator. Then down to verse 31, Moses says, praying, Oh, what a terrible sin these people have committed. They have made gods of gold for themselves. Now listen to this, folks. Moses prays. But now, if you'll only forgive their sin, but if not, erase my name from the record you have written. Moses offers his own life in prayer. This whole section highlights the role and the importance of the mediator. Without a mediator, you understand Israel does not survive this incident. And that's the whole point of Exodus chapter 32. Without a mediator, without the mound Moses appointed by God stepping in, Israel does not exist after Exodus chapter 32. Moses is the instrument that God chooses to use to be the conveyor of God's mercy to his people. And when you think about it, Moses is in fact a picture, a signpost along the way of what is to come. Because after all, Moses is only a human being. He can't perfectly do it, but someone else will. Someone without sin, without a flaw, one who has chosen to follow and do everything God commands, one who will live to honor God's glory perfectly. You see, that is the good news of the gospel. This passage points ahead to a mediator slash man who will live out the Ten Commandments perfectly, and not only externally, but from the heart, the God slash man who can stand between a righteous, holy God and sinful people. You see, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is on the move. And I believe he wants us to be a people who have so experienced the grace of the cross of Jesus that our lives will be transformed more and more into the image of him. Only through Jesus can our own sin of idolatry be forgiven. It's only Jesus who can save you and me from our emotional and moral collapse. But notice simply, it is prayer that changes everything here. The Bible tells us that the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Now, finally, we can look at Exodus chapter 33, starting at verse 9. As he, Moses, went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and hover at its entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. When the people saw the cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they would stand and bow in front of their own tents. Inside the tent of meaning, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Inside the tent of meaning. Up to this point, the people had only brief glimpses of the glory of God in the wilderness. However, it's always been God's intention, as we studied last week, to be in an ongoing conversational relationship with his beloved people. The book of Exodus records God giving Moses instruction to gather from among the Israelites the materials required to build a complex tent structure, the tabernacle, and then gives detailed instructions on how to construct it. The formal worship life of God's people is to play place here. In fact, nearly a third of the book of Exodus is taken up with detailed plans for the tabernacle. As one author put it, 13 chapters of non-story can be wearisome reading. However, 
These exhaustive details make an important point. Such residents cannot be taken lightly. God himself is coming to live among his people. And it's worth pausing and looking at this, and that's what we're doing today. God dwelling with his people. Inside the tent of meaning, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Here, Moses enjoyed this unique personal relationship with God. The Lord would speak to him face to face as man speaks with his friend. This intimacy enabled Moses to boldly ask God to renew his covenant relationship with the Israelites. Although they were in close proximity to one another, even Moses, the man of God, the faithful servant, was not permitted to look directly upon God. Verse 9 implies that the tent curtain shielded Moses, who was inside, from God, who was outside, in the cloud of his Shekinah glory. This is a further reminder of the barrier which exists between the divine and the human. But again, you know the great news of the gospel is that because of our mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ, we too can approach God as a friend. I love this passage from Hebrews chapter 4. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weakness. And we can perhaps say the occasion when we too at times fall into idolatry. For he, Jesus, faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. And there we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. That's what prayer is all about, inviting God to help us. So let's conclude at look, by looking at Moses' prayer in verse 12. One day Moses said to the Lord, You've been telling me, take these people up to the promised land, but you haven't told me whom you will send with me. You have told me, I know you by name, I'll look favorably on you. If it is true that you look favorably on me, let me know your ways so I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. There's a good prayer right there. And remember that this nation is your very own people. And then just a couple of verses down, it says that God himself will go with Moses. The Bible never gives us glimpses of God's presence merely for an intellectual discussion. He allows us to have those moments in his presence in order to help us to love and serve him better. So when Moses prays and God answers and reveals his glory, he is doing it for a very practical purpose, namely this, to give Moses encouragement to get on with the mission of leading his people to the promised land. You see, I believe that the deepest truths of God that we discover are meant to apply to our everyday life. The truths of God revealed in the Bible are our immense personal and practical importance. In the account, Moses is given encouragement that God will be with them and the people. And then it leads Moses to some very practical implications as the story continues in the book of Exodus. So how can we apply this to our daily lives? Let me give you three quick things, very quick. First of all, gratitude. It's all about continuing to be grateful to God. Thank you, thank you, Lord, for your goodness shown to us 
sinners. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Thank you that you have sent the perfect mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. Two, it means hope for any one of us. Moses needed hope that God really could forgive a rebellious people who had broken the first two commandments, even after God had rescued them from Egypt. The Lord, though, can change things through your faithful prayers. And three, let, let me teach you one of the most exciting prayers from the book of Exodus, chapter 33, down to verse 18. Very, very simple. Moses prays this, then show me, Lord, your glorious presence. That's a wonderful prayer. That could be a daily prayer. Lord, show me your glorious presence. Let's pray right now. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for passages like this that show us the bad news, but underline the good news. We thank you, Lord, that you have sent a perfect mediator between God and human beings, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, continue to teach us to be grateful. Teach us to be hopeful, Lord. And teach us to continue to cry out for your amazing presence. And this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Bible teaches us that the giving of our resources is actually an act of worship. In effect, we are praising God through our generosity. If you wish to support St. Hilda's ministry, please go to our website at sthildaschurch.ca to make a donation. Thank you very much. Our Father in heaven, holy your name, your love and protection to me. We continue in prayer. We pray for God's grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, through your grace, we are your people. Through your Son, you have redeemed us. In your Spirit, 
you have made us your own. Father, we are so blessed to be your people. We thank you, Lord, for your amazing presence with us because of Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you, Lord, that we are part of your body, the church, and we continue to pray for the church of God. We remember Bishop Charlie and the other clergy and leaders within the Anglican Network in Canada. We pray for Archbishop Foley Beach giving leadership to the Anglican Church of North America. We bless you, Lord, for our own church, St. Hilda's. Lord, we pray that we would be faithful in seeking you and in acting on how you direct us in prayer. Make our hearts respond to your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for our world. Many places suffering, many places suffering from injustice, from poverty, from violence. And we ask you, Lord, to rescue your people. We pray that we would be faithful witnesses in a world that is often hurt and hurts each other. Make our lives bear witness to your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for each other today. We pray especially for those people that we know within our families, our friends, who are suffering in any way. We pray for the healing hand of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to be upon them. And Lord, in our hearts, we invite your presence, your Shekinah glory, to touch the people that we have on our minds today. Bless them, Lord. Heal them, restore them, encourage them, comfort them, and strengthen them, we pray. Make our wills eager to obey you, Lord, and our hands ready to heal. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we give you thanks for the many blessings in our lives, for your wonderful presence, Lord, your goodness. Lord, we thank you for Jesus, for saving us, for restoring us, for rescuing us. And Lord, we thank you that you do have a purpose for our lives. Help us, Lord, to follow you each day in commitment and in discipleship. Make our voices one with all of your people in heaven and on earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And gathering all our prayers, we pray the Lord's Prayer together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen pray together. Almighty God, Father of, our, of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all of your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor 
and glory throughout all ages. Amen. of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Again, thank you for joining us today. And we do pray that you would have a blessed week.